service unto the Lord led by faithful men of God who love him as much as we do and we're grateful for all who are able to make it back we once again this tradition being known as Mother's Day we encourage the mothers to hear our voice that we thank God for you all over the world and we're grateful for the hard work that you do and the empowerment that God has given you as keepers of the home to branch out and help where other areas are necessary to help in the lives of saints to help with other extended family members uh, relatives and also to teach the saints when we gather and praise and song of God as well as classes that uh, our women teach that the Lord has approved and so we're thankful for mothers who lead the way in those areas uh, they help to solidify the home to keep it uh, in its proper pattern by their support of the head of the house the husband as well as their head which is jesus christ and so we're thankful once again wish you a happy mother's day we hope you got to enjoy yourselves if not maybe later on today we had a message this morning to encourage uh the mothers throughout the world especially those in the large church you can re uh, receive that message uh, as brother frizz has done a wonderful job of already posting uh, that particular message we thank God for his efforts brother Jack efforts as well as others uh, I know brother Robert Johnson worked real hard junior in the sound room as well you know at the time we had it at the other building so we're thankful to God for all the men and women who work so uh, this evening we're going to have a message that gets back to Acts chapter 17 uh, there's a message I believe of power a message of grace as well as a message of mercy people talk all the time about christianity and what it uh can do for us and how we can serve in it but we have to understand that jesus said something that was very powerful concerning the thought of we being a tree and the lord was very specific in helping us to understand the importance of this image of a tree if you have your Bible please let us turn together to Matthew 7 and we will go back to Acts chapter 17 in a moment as we get some information because I believe in every man and woman being able to make a change in their life change in their walk a change in what they do for others and their personal thoughts that roll around their head when they and I myself all of us are alone Matthew chapter number 17 Jesus is going to deal uh, with this particular concept of the tree and it will bring to light some thoughts that Paul also said and we'll go there as well in a minute because the saints have to understand God is a God of productivity. He looks for fruit. He consumes the fruit. He doesn't chew us up. He consumes the work that we bring forth. And it is a work that can only be done by the saints of God. So I think I may have told you Matthew 17. Please have mercy on me. I meant Matthew 7. I have a pair of glasses I should be able to see very well. But I was looking at the verse uh, that has the word tree in it. And I was thinking 17. It's Matthew 7. And we will begin at verse 15. Beware of false prophets. Matthew 7, 15. Which come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly they are ravening wolves. So they will come looking like a saint but inside they obviously will be devils and so Paul says verse I mean Matthew says verse number 16 you shall know them by their fruit now we have a problem here in the saints kingdom the kingdom where the saints dwell and accepting rotten fruit stinks and God will have no part with it 
at all, dear brethren. And we have to understand these are works that are brought forth. They are works. And so he says, this is how you know them. Now notice, not by their words alone, because a person can talk what we used to say, a good game, but may not can play the sport. So the idea is that we can talk about Christianity, but there's a fruit that comes forth. Now, the first fruit, obviously, is our words. They should be sound in the faith. But the actions must follow. Because some people will say things. And you know, I'm going to be honest, brethren. If you want to have brethren dislike you, start talking about fruit on the tree. You'll have a whole list, a long line wrapped around the building of your life waiting to bash you for having had the audacity to think that we should actually produce fruit. It's kind of an enigma. We talk about it, but it really never happens. But it's a lie because it has to happen to get to heaven. He says, do men gather grapes of thorns? Now, this seems simple, but this is a power punch. Or figs of thistles. No one would think this of a real tree. Verse 17, even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. Very important to remember, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. So now the problem is, if you should see a beautiful tree that appears to be good, bringing forth corrupt fruit, that would be the analogy of the sheep that is a wolf. And brethren, you and I are going to have to dig deep into our souls. And we're going to have to come to grips with, we can't talk about Christianity, it must be walked. The church can't talk about doing good works. They have to actually be done. And we're not talking about someone being perfect. We understand people are going to ever. We're talking about a pattern that is developed within the kingdom of Almighty God. Look at verse 18. A good tree, here comes even more awesome, outstanding thought. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Now, I'm worried now about some brethren. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down. And cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. So Jesus ends up with what he started uh, out with. And so, if we think about that, brethren, this will help us in our walk. Now, let's take a look. You know, we understand that people err. But our lesson is God calls all men everywhere to repent chain so what do what type of fruit do you expect from a good tree that is bringing forth evil fruit well no 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 see i just said something that can't exist let's go back to the text a good tree he says brings forth cannot bring forth evil fruit. So I just, I just said that. I said, what do you think about a good tree bringing forth evil fruit? It can't. So brethren, let's, let's dig deep in our souls. This is a very important lesson. Change is what you have to do. You don't have to die. First Corinthians 15. Everybody's not going to die. But everybody got to change. All men everywhere must change. All men everywhere don't have to die. Because Jesus is going to come back one day. So you've heard people say, we all got to die, baby. No, we don't, baby. But we all got to change. So, if you see a person sin or err or begin to walk contrary, and you go to them, you say, in essence, you know, I've never known you to walk this way. In essence, you're a good tree. How are you bringing forth evil fruit? At that point, there should be a change after the second admonition. And you should see good fruit. If not, that tree is corrupt. Now, brethren, this is something that if we don't get, 
We are going to lose our souls. Brethren, don't stay in sin. Brethren, churches that are good don't continue to follow error. They stop. They repent. We are under some type of satanic drug if we think that a church of Christ is going to continue year after year sinning and sinning and sinning upon doctrine, upon works. And you still going to call that a good tree? Read this because, see, remember, we already know the tree going to possibly can mess up at some time. But when you go to the tree for it to be blameless, it must change. After the second admonition, how do we know? Let's go to Titus. Quickly go to Titus chapter number 2. Titus chapter 2. And let us look at what the Lord has said to us concerning this problem. Now, forgive me, Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, the third chapter. If you meant to flip over. Verse 9, but avoid foolish questions and, end, and genealogies, forgive me, and contentions and strivings about the law. But they are unprofitable and vain. The, the, the basis of debating the tithe, unprofitable and vain. Sabbath day worship, unprofitable and vain. Strivings. I'm just trying to teach a concept of giving. You can't through the law. It's striving. Bally says, okay, it's unprofitable. And it's empty. It has no spiritual value. And you don't profit. You won't develop and begin to grow good fruit. So he says in verse 10, A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject. We won't practice that. And sin just runs rapid through the church. It lives, it thrives in the kingdom of God like a cancer. Verse 11, Knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinned, being condemned of himself. So I want to know, what's a bad tree then? If a bad tree can't produce good fruit, and a good tree can't produce bad fruit, and you see bad fruit, how can you call that tree good after you know for a fact two admonitions have been given? No other thing that have to be from you. Two admonitions. It did not say two admonitions from you. Two admonitions. And we have to understand why is that. If you think the admonitions weren't spiritual, okay, then you go give to in spirituality. In the spirit of meekness. Knowing that the person is subverted. And that the devil has entangled them at his will according to the letter of Timothy. But here's the problem. Brethren, you don't get the authority to give a pass card. The tree's still good. The tree's still good. Now if it's producing bad fruit, then here's your challenge. Go and find figs among thorns. When you can find us a fig at any season among a thorn tree, we're running with you. Grapes among thistles. You have two trees. You got two options. Two choices. Go to a uh, and find some grapes among some thistles. See, brethren, one of the things that we're going to have to accept about the Creator is He gives point blank impossible to argue statements. That's why I don't like using other analogies. I've gotten out of that. I clocked out of that business a while ago. Because the scripture analogy is powerful. Stick a bush, not going to find no grapes, no figs. Fig trees don't have thorns and thistles on them. See, now it'd be bad if a fig tree had thorns and thistles. Well, you know, a fig tree, y'all, ah, grace don't have thorns and thistles. Mm -mm. So now you got to stop and say, is this tree good? Is this tree good? Because it looks like it just cannot produce. It cannot produce the fruit of righteousness. Brethren, what we have to understand is, is that you begin to wonder if the scriptures are even telling the truth anymore when you think unrighteous fruit from men still allows them to be unrighteous to be righteous it still allows them in your mind to be righteous now here's another thing i want to share with you what you have to be well once you say in your heart that brother or sister is still good what you're actually telling us is you live like that 
And when I be telling you, I live like that. You know why? Because I need a validation. I think it's still good. A lot of people have issues. See, and I'm really talking about me. Yeah. You got to watch that. Because see, now you done told on yourself. I tell on me. And we know you live in a double life. See, because you never heard that out of Jesus' mouth. When does he speak well of Zacchaeus? Come down, I want to eat with you, for he too is the son of God of Abraham. Come on down. Why? Because he's acting like he got some sense now. And he drops down out of his mouth without encouragement. I'm going to get back fourfold any man that I burnt, literally, to paraphrase, or taken from, ripped off. Good tree now. Good fruit. No more thistles. Good handful of figs and a good handful of grapes. You never hear Jesus talking about crooks in good light. But you saints do that nonsense all the time. And then we want to wonder why the church can't get off its feet and move forward. The plane can't fly. Because you got dead weight at the congregation right. that is trying to portray itself as holy, but just cannot produce good fruit. Brethren, the word repent is a word that means you do not do that stuff no more. Basic. I don't go that way anymore. I don't go that way. I go the other way now. And what we're having a problem is, it's sort of like holding on to a raggedy car that you know it won't start. And you keep getting up in the morning, room, room, putting back this is shot. And you tell me, I'm just, you know, but my cousin gave me this car, and I know it's gonna work. It's a piece of giant. It's not gonna work. You're late for work. You're mad because the thing is not right. And you have to understand, saints are like that. Try to start, won't start. New battery, won't start. If you get it started, won't go and drive. And what you're doing is you're saying it's okay, but God is saying, you know the tree by its fruit, saints. He's telling us children, you know the tree by its fruit. See, you're thinking, well, Jose, I think nobody can see it. I didn't say anything. I'm saying when you go to them, the hardest prick, and they come back to God. But see, we're waiting like it takes time. Because hmm. see, you go to them. And the heart comes back to God. Because the words that you speak are so powerful. They cause that raggedy thistle to start popping out great and change right before your eyes. Brethren, are you living like that? Are you conducting yourself? Am I going to do that around saints? Are you going to still let that lack of days ago performance drag down? Because I'm telling you, at some point, you're going to start popping out some thistles and some thorns. You can't help but do it because God is not going to keep you uplifted if you're going to start pointing to trees that cannot produce fruit and saying they're okay with Jesus. See, you can't. How do we know that? So the first Corinthians chapter 5. Well, nobody's sleeping with nobody mama, nobody's daddy wife, but one boy. And Paul says, your whole congregation is full of sin. There's only one guy who's sleeping with his daddy's wife. How the whole congregation get full of yeast? How's that possible? Because when you put yeast in dough and you need it, it's everywhere. But let me tell you who's doing the need. Satan. He takes the yeast of this boy and permeates it through the church and brings it to this mind. Well, that's that boy. That's between him and his dad. To this mind. Hey, that girl won't be like that. Let her be to this mind. And then all of a sudden, it's in everybody's mind that it's okay. It's okay. It doesn't mean much. That's his sin. That's not me. That's that brother. See, you don't function like that. Because in this vineyard, all the trees are by each other. And they affect each other. And that's where you and I must learn... You take the physical and you see where God places it spiritual. You, you, it's not a real tree, brethren. I know you know that. It's not real figs. It's not real thistles and thorns. It is a problem, a sin in someone's life that's pricking. And everybody that reaches for that person, you ever touch a stomach and you come away with bleeding fingers. If you reach for a thorn or thistle bush as you do a beautiful, lovely fig or grape cluster, you coming out bleeding. I'm telling you, I'm taking to the bank. You coming out bleeding. Because when you reach for grapes, you reach and grab, grab. They soft, they, 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 they're strong if you don't watch. You grab figs, they come right out. Sometimes they'll fall down. Who you're going to fall. Reach for a thistle bush and you coming out with blood. And what it's saying, when you touch that tree and it's reaction, oh, it's going to prick you. What happens when you get pricked, brethren? 
You get pricked, you get pricked to do what they're doing. I don't know why when we look at that, we don't understand that the Lord is saying, be careful, this tree no good to you. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 5. And we're going to go back to, we're going to see the thrust of the 17th chapter of Acts to understand why is Paul losing his mind over somebody else having a fake God because he knows it's going to kill the land. It's going to kill all y'all. You are thin. It's going to take all of you out because this is the problem in Athens. Look at 1 Corinthians 5. He says, it's reported commonly that there's fornication among you. So it's among them. Are they all doing? No, it's among them. It's a boy sleeping with his dad. Is like, oh, a man, a male, an adult. But he is a man sleeping with his daddy's wife. Having sex with her. I want to understand what we're talking about. Not going to bed, sleeping. He's having sex with her, which is a sin that even the Gentiles refuse to accept in their system of worship. Whatever they worship. Whoever they worship. They won't even accept this one. So he says... And such one case has not so much as name among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And you're puffed up and have not rather mourned. So what happened? They didn't mourn. What happens when a saint doesn't mourn about another person's sin? Just like I say, he say, you know, he did what? Man, that boy, I knew that boy was crazy. But well, that's his life. See, that's not the reaction. You know, he did what? Man, it's going to... Man, this is a sin. It's destroying. It's gonna destroy the church. We gotta stop this. See, that's a, that's a sorrow. Like you heard about somebody dying because the boy is dying. He's sick. The soul is dying. No, it's not all right, brother. And it's not gonna get better. The preacher not gonna start teaching truth till somebody tells him, man, you need to stop teaching what you're teaching. That's an error. And we're not gonna let you be here no more if you don't stop teaching that. Now, if you don't have a man in the house strong enough to do that. A sister in the house strong enough to tell her husband or another brother to do it. You got a dead church full of yeast. And you can just look at what they produce and you say, man, that is thorns and thistles. That is not grace. And it's surely not fear. Mm -hmm. But see, we're a fool ourselves. But they try. Oh, yeah, does a, let me ask you, does a fig tree try to grow figs or does it grow it? Does a grape cluster try to grow grapes or does it grow? Does a thorn bush try to grow thorns or do it grow? It grows it. Brethren, one thing you and I are going to have to understand, you will never win a debate against God on a physical analogy because he made the item. He know how it works. You never win. And so, therefore, if you can't beat him in a physical debate, you can kiss the hopes of a spiritual debate goodbye. That's nothing you can say. No wisdom, no knowledge, no understanding. Proverbs said can come against the Lord. Nothing you have about, let's wait. You don't have anything to say other than what did the Lord say to you. Like you tell these people, get this boy out the number. Tell him he's not wanted. Don't block the door and beat him. Tell him he's not. The words himself, you're not wanted here. You're withdrawn from is enough to run off any crook because they feel that power of God. But that's why our crooks like to hang out at the church because they know brethren are so afraid to say, we don't want you here. Well, if you lose a member, that's money. That's a crooked evangelist too. That's right. Or a crooked group of leaders. That are planning on building something that the Lord did not ask them to build usually. That's where the problem lies. So what happens here? He says very clearly. He says, you're not rather mourn that he had done his deed. Might be taken away from you. It should be such a morning that you go, you know what You know what the prayer should be? That should be a prayer visual call. When we have, if, we, if it was our congregation, on the first Wednesday we have in prayer, we should be praying, oh Lord, take away this evil beast who is shacking with his woman. He won't marry her, Lord. Oh, Father, just take him away. That's the kind of prayer I need to hear. Not God is good, and we know that already. He loves us all, yes. He's a God of mercy. We know that too. But we need to talk about this boy who don't know how to act like a man in this congregation. Amen. He said, you should have more that it be taken away. Who are you going to mourn to? The law? Not the police. The Lord. So somebody should have been praying. And every time they come up and pray, he, he here. Got the while the Lord let them know, you know they talking about you. They're talking about you and that daddy, wife of yours, fooling around. I feel like I'm not one here. You know when you go to say that to a saint? I feel like I'm not one here. He say, you're not, brother. Unless you plan on repenting. You know why I won't do that? Because we're a tree. That's not producing grapes or figs either in doctrine. You might be walking a certain walk personally right, but when it comes to this part of the doctrine, the Lord's hand gets stuck every time he tries to reach. You know who's reaching for the grapes? You and I, the Lord, to consume the work that we see coming. Brethren, when you 
see Christianity as reality, you don't have no problem telling about, yeah, we don't want you here. We don't. We really, really don't. Because you, you've been living with that girl for nine months. She got married by now. So you need to get married. We love you enough to tell you that. So I'll never come back there. I mean, we, we really, we don't want you back. Because you're yeast. If you had to make some unleavened bread, you know how important it was to not have yeast? It was so important. You read in the Old Testament, the Lord say, when it comes to the Passover time, he say, I want you to go in your cupboard and take it and throw it in the garbage. I don't want it in your house. Why? Because somebody going to ask it. One thing we know, somebody going to ask it and grab the pot that's got yeast in it and thought it was flour. And now we got risen bread and we can't eat the Passover. We, we just going to eat what we got. And the rights going to say, man, I'm not eating me with y'all. I'm going next door to the neighbors. Y'all crazy in here. Talk about eat what we got. This is yeast bread. Some Jews were faithful and some were rotten trees with pricks on them. And we need to understand the system of God enriches your life, gives you confidence and faith in illness and lost opportunities financially. And people attacking you and rearing your children and having confidence your husband or wife is faithful to you and having confidence the church is the right place to be. And when you get yeast in you, you're just swollen with words, but you got no power, you got no faith. And then you'll be wondering why you so nervous and everybody else calm. Stop going around. Everybody, what's wrong with them? Because you don't have confidence in God. And you think he's going to give you the count? So you can't get faith by yourself. No. So he has to give you the measurement. When your faith gets weak, he has to strengthen you by allowing you to say, you just got to believe what I'm telling you. And we have to understand that. So now as we look further, just a few more verses from this section, and we're going to Acts 17. He says clearly, I bear it in verse 3, as present, as absent in body, so my body not there, but present in spirit. How? Because he is in agreement with what the spirituality of the church was, or even once was, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that had done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, with the who? See, here, look at the key. He said, okay, he said, my spirit is like I'm going to be there. Y'all gather, he said, but what kind of power source are we going to need? The most strongest leader out, <laughs> he's too weak to do anything. All the leaders together, too weak. How about the whole church? Too weak. The power of Jesus Christ. Amen. Faith that now the Lord say, do this. So we got power. And he says, with his power to deliver such a one to who? You know, sometimes people say this, you gotta watch this. Turn him over to Jesus. Uh-uh. Turn him over to Satan. And make sure we understand what we're talking about here. Somebody say, baby, I'm just, somebody say, well, I, I just turned that child of mine over to Jesus. You didn't say, no, you mean turn him over to Satan. No, man, turn over to Jesus. No, no, no. They was already with Jesus. Was you, you were telling about Jesus, weren't you? Well, yeah, bro. Well, you didn't turn him over to Satan. No. Nah. What you mean, read this verse. Say, now, nah, he finna eat their lunch. And, and it's going to affect him physically. It's going to affect him physically. And if they don't love the Lord anymore, then they won't come back spiritually. But if they still love the Lord and they cry, Abba, Father, the Lord said, okay, I'm going to take, take this dog off you, Satan. If you come on back to me the right way, you got to come back to your bed and to let them know you was wrong. Then you get strength to come back. It's a simple process. I've had to live it before. I'm telling you, once you get bit a few times, you get tired of the devil bothering you. Right. You have to understand. He says, uh, why? For the destruction of the flesh. He didn't say anything about turning over to the Lord. The Lord is the one telling you, I don't want nothing to do with him no more. He's saying, y'all don't want crying and mourning, or mourning mad because he got to go. I want you to cry and mourn and ask me to get him out. The Lord says that the spirit may be saved in the Lord. So the only hope is turn him over to the devil. Let him get whooped. Let him get a couple of teeth knocked out. Let him come back with one eye, metaphorically. A ear that can't heal no more. And get whooped enough to know, man, I'm never going back out there in the world. And you know, brethren, I long to see the day when the saints do that. I remember the time the saints used to do that. I remember the time you could go to a congregation and, boy, you'd be surprised if they hadn't already withdrawn from somebody. They'd read you the list. I remember the time when my wife and I visited Baton Rouge. We were young people. I had jet black full head of hair. 
Are you young folks went in there? They were reading off a list of people they had withdrawn from. And they were naming people that they were working with. And I said, what a church. Man, you, <laughs> you go by that now. You wonder if it is the church of Christ anymore. I'm telling you, I'm taking them, I'm blindfolding in the midst of the group. And you'd see, is this the church? That's right. But it used to be a time you could go in any church and say, you know, we were drunk. Somebody came with an idea. I don't think this is the way a prickly pear came up with an idea. I don't think this is the way. And started destroying the church. And for some reason, we think the Lord has forgotten his system that he started with. <laughs> I kid you not. I'll tell you no. And you don't want to be the one to get to the judgment and find out, no, he didn't change his plan. That was the prickly pear talking crazy, not the figs and the grapes of the law. And we need to understand. And see, this strikes fear in a person. The man, I need to act right because my family will disown me. See, you thinking loves and hugs don't do not. Loves and hugs are for the repentant part. Because you'll see in the seventh chapter, we go over to the second level. That's when he says, receive him with love and welcome him back. And don't beat him up no more. And we do the opposite of that. When they come back, we gut punch them. Say, hey, good, welcome back. Poof, gut punch them. Knee them in the stomach. And you just sit on the back pew and don't say nothing no more. We are the opposite of God. I'm talking about this present coming. I'm talking about the saints, a lot of them in general. He, and how did he sum up? He said, what should I like in this generation to? And with this saying, we see, we're worse than that generation. We're worse because we wax worse and worse. He said, they're like children. See, when you deal with children, children in the marketplace, children like to play fun songs when it's time to be sad. You always said, sit down, baby. Stop there. Sit down. It's a sad time. Children will dance out of few. Like, sit down, baby. It's a sad time. And they'll cry when it's time for everybody to be happy. We go into the park. Oh, I want ice cream. Go Stop that! We better go have fun. They don't know what to do. That's why it says you're like children in the marketplace. When it's time to be sad, you party. When it's time to party, you're sad. He says, and that's why I can't help you. He said, John came to you, and it was time to mourn you were partying. He said, I come to you, and it's time to have joy. And you're mad at me. The opposite. How do we change? Listen to God's word. And understand, you got to produce the fruit, or you are not what you say you are. And no, I'm not. We go by fruit. I don't know of any man that can go. There are a lot of trees that have pretty similar leaves. But when fruit season comes, you already know what it is. Walk up there and say, okay, I know what this is. I know what this is. I know what this is. So somebody can remove all the signs that you have. So we don't know what tree it is. What a man said, wait till fruit season comes. We'll know what each one of them is. But how can you tell? What if, it, what if the seeds blow from one tree to the next? They'll tell you, that can't happen. And you think it can't happen in spirituality? It can't happen. It can't, brethren. Now we can go to Acts 17. This will read like butter coming off bread hot. It will be so easy to read. And then we can see what is Paul talking about. Why is he talking so strong to people who are worshiping idols? Because Paul knows when I speak my words, your thinners like to hear something new. You can act crazy all day. He brings strange things up. Paul said, I know you know what I'm talking about. Because your inscription over here says, you know who the original God is. That's why it's always capitalized. It's a message saying, this is the first one God. And they know about him, but didn't know him. So Paul said, yeah, I'm going to tell you about him. Say, because you're ignorant they worship him. He didn't break down all the history of God and I create. He, because the words he is saying, the same words you bring. When somebody thinks they can play an instrument, you said, "Is it made with man's hands?" That's all I want to know. Yeah, yeah. So you can tell me, so I can tell you, yeah, because I can see right there. That one has a music company right here in Houston. Now I know they made that one. You can't use that one to praise God, and you're done. It doesn't matter who believes, you're done. Don't touch the prickly bush. Just walk away if they don't want to talk anymore. But if you're used to, in the church, accepting rotten trees that cannot produce fruit, you're going to have difficulty dealing with that outsider who cannot produce fruit at all because they have yet to be born and recreated as a fruit-producing tree in the kingdom of God. So now you don't know what to do. And then just a short period of time, the great God of heaven will remove your hedges, He'll knock down your towel. You won't be able to see trouble coming. That's what he means. He'll knock down a towel. Hedge is gone. All kind of badgers going to be coming. You know, they had tabs some grapes, man. Little foxes, little jaws just full of grapes. 
You can have all your fruit torn, fig trees ripped up, the fruit gone. But that's your life that's going to be altered. That's your blessings, your understanding of God. So he says in Acts 17, he says, Now when they had passed through Amphilos and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews, and Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them three Sabbath days, reasoned with them of the scriptures. See, so he took the scriptures of God and reasoned with them and told them, saying, you know, you, you can't do this. You can't live like this. You can't walk in this manner. Opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. So this God, this Nazarene, this, Nazarene, this guy who was a, a carpenter like his dad, this guy whose mother's name is Mary, James, Joseph's brothers, got several brothers, several sisters. And he said, okay, yeah, this is the guy, what I'm telling you about. This guy that they put on the tree, uh, the Romans killed. He said, this is the guy. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas and of devout Greeks, a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. So look at the power of the women we talked about this morning. Look at the power of the women. Chief women, not a few. What is a chief woman? This is a woman who has a power, who has a respect in the land, may have money. Not a crook, she's a powerful person. Well respected, well known. I say, she believed? Wow. Now the Lord says to the disciples, not many of these are chosen, but every now and then you grab a couple of these who are powerful. Every now and then you'll get a Supreme Court justice. One's going to be mentioned. The scriptures mentioned all the time. Supreme Court justice. Can you imagine baptizing the Supreme Court justice? <laughs> he talked to them, y'all eat lunch? Yeah, I'm baptizing the guy. That's how it is. Every now and then you get one. Because there's so much power, just so hard for them to believe the system of God. But every now and then you'll get one. But the Jews which believe not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the base. So that's gangster. So now here's holy men, because they are moved with envy. They're jealous that Paul doesn't have a following. People are listening to them all over. They're coming into the place of knowledge. The Athenian hub. And all of a sudden, now they're going to get some gangster. That's right. Gangsters, what well, basically saw gang like dope slangers. That's right, robbers, thieves, rapists, whatever. Gangsters, low class folks. Why would a holy person so called go get a gang? Because I'm not holy, and I too am a spiritual gangster. So I'm gonna get a physical and see so can I beat you down and shut you up. So he says, and gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jay. You see the word assault and such bring them out the people. <laughs> let's go. Jason the one helping them out. Let's go, let's go take care of him. Assault. Oh, you know what this is? <laughs> That's what gangsters do, assault people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren to the rules of the city. They grabbed, but you try to grab out. You think he went about to get out of here? Crying. Saying, uh, uh, that's a saying aloud. These have turned the world upside down and come hither also, whom Jason had received, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar. Now they on Caesar's side. Can you imagine Jews who believe in the Most High God and the hope of a coming Christ now are on Caesar's team? This sounds like a reprise, a repass, doesn't of what they did to Jesus. So it doesn't matter who you are. What did Jesus say? If they did it to the master of the house, speaking of himself, he said he's going to do it to the children. And here's Jason, one of the children. Here's Paul, his entourage, one of the children. Here's Luke and one of the children. Finna get handled because they cannot stand those that walk like Christ. He said, saying that there's another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people in the rules of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason and of the other, they let them go. My, my, my. Do y'all see what's going on here, brethren, and what you're dealing with in society? It is the same thing that we have to deal with. Someone's always coming with some way to hinder the saints of God, to hold them back from being able to produce, to make the walk a little bit more difficult. It isn't enough that we have to wrestle with our own, brethren, but here in this particular thought, too. And... Now we look at this fact is that verse number 10. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, coming thither and went into the synagogue of the Jews. So they leave this ungodly, crooked place. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica. And they 
receive the word with all readiness of mind and search the scriptures daily. Well, those things were so that's here goes some people that's different, a little bit more noble than Thessalonians. They say, I mean, we're gonna use the Bible. What you say, Paul? Okay, let's look and see if it's in the scripture. And it, it, sometimes you'll talk to the denomination person and say, Well, you say that's in the Bible, they're gonna turn on too. It's like a Berean. Okay, I believe it. They say you can baptize me now. I'm ready. I remember Javier was like that. They just showed me in the Bible and said, I'm ready. See, he's like a Berean. Been faithful ever since. And many of you. He says, uh, Therefore many of them believe. Look at it mentioned again. Second time. Second time. Also of honorable women. Which were Greeks and of men out of few. Why does the Bible keep mentioning honorable women? Because women of honor. And women who rule in cities. They can have an impact on us. Because they are as respected as a male. It isn't just about baptizing me. It's about baptizing anybody. Woman or man. And twice the Bible in one chapter has mentioned the importance of talking to everybody about Jesus. Women want to go to heaven too. But when the Jews of Thessalonica, now look at that, he go there, follow them one land. <laughs> here they go again. When they heard the word of God preached of Paul and Berea, they came to the altar and stirred the people. Here they go again. They over, they over in Berea. Let's go. What a bunch of evil beasts. Verse 14. And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go as they were to see. But Silas and Timotheus abode there still. And they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus for to come to him with all speed they departed. Verse 16. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him. Why? When he saw the city wholly given to Athens, just full of Ida. You know, somewhere where you see what well, churches everywhere. Mount Hebron Baptist Church. Oh, uh, uh, the honorable Elijah Muhammad Temple. You run around here. Here's another thing around the corner. Uh, uh, Reverend so and so, Church of God in Christ no more. You've been like, man, this place is full of false churches, false idolatry churches, false image churches. Mary's, uh, St. Mary's Catholic Church. Why didn't Mary get a church? Nevertheless, therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and the market daily. With them that met with him. Notice the two groups. Jews devout. They divided to idolatry. And got the Jews divided to Judaism. Both on the same team. Need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 18. Then said. Now here come. Now I'm going to tell you. These two guys. If you have a chance. Look them up. Here comes some heavy hitting. Cross talking. Jingle jangle philosophers. And today. In your land. This country. America. And all over the world. The Teaching of the Epicurean and the Stoic is part of what you hear on a daily basis in your government, in business, and in churches that are false. Still today. And now he's going to talk to the originators, some of the heavy hitters. Paul had a battle. It said, then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and the Stoics encountered him. Look what they think about him. And some say, oh, this battle say. Now they don't call Paul a babbler. Like he just repeating something he heard, but he don't know how to defend. They can't defend the nonsense that they're teaching. They're the babblers. And so is every denominational person. And every Dalai Lama father. You're a babbler. You can't validate that nonsense by what standard? A book that a dead man wrote? This is a book that a live God inspired to the men who are now dead to write before they die. Major difference. He says, what would this babbler say? Others say, he seemed to be a set of forth of strange God. Now you're worshiping idols. You have the audacity to say Paul's teaching of God is strange. Isn't that, what a, isn't that, that, that's something. What a bunch of devils. That's the only word I can think. Because he preaches to them Jesus and the resurrection. Now they don't believe in the resurrection, but they believe in some nonsense they made up. And he took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. Thou bringest certain strange things to our ears, and we know therefore what we say, we would know what, therefore what these things mean. Verse 21 For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or hear something new. These people need to repent, brethren. They need to change. You can't just run around, paper to the wind, something new. Oh, here we go. You hear about the Epicurus? Oh, here's the story. Oh, here's this. It's like paper blowing in the wind. You ever watch paper blowing in the wind? Wherever the wind says it's going to go, that's where it goes. Every wind of doctrine. 
He says in verse 22, the apostle in the midst of Mars hills and said, You men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you're too superstitious. For I pass by and beheld your devotion. I found an altar with this inscription. See this one? Look these words up to the unknown God. That's the first one God. It's the original. They don't know him no more, but they know about him. Whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. So the Lord's spirit, ne his spirit never went in and stayed in the temple that even Solomon built. But in us, he will. We're his temple. Amen. His children. And we got the fruit to show it. He says, verse 25, Neither is worship with man's hand, as though he needed anything, seeing he gave it to all life and breath and all things. If someone's giving you life and breath and all things, what could you possibly give them? They're giving you life and breath and all things. If you gave them something, they would say, well, I gave it to you. Well, you don't give somebody something, and they gave it to you. And had made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and had determined the times before appointed, and the bounds of their habitation. So no, no aliens came and brought us here. That's out. Face of the earth. Not from Mars. It's a bunch of nonsense teeth. Can't have Jesus and the alien too. Verse 27. That they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him. Though he be not far from every one of us. The Lord determined and allows man's heart to have fear. I don't think we should go in that land. And so they stay right there. Why? Because he's going to send men out. He, there's nobody in America. The Mormons are liars. They have no way to validate that someone was in America during the time of the first century when Christ is on the scene in Africa. They have nothing other than a lie from Joseph Smith and others. Just have them say, can you validate it? Say, what can you validate? If they say carbon testing, carbon testing has already been shown. It is not valid. There are some things that they have tested and said they thought it was old and that. That junk not valid. No, the earth hasn't been in no billions of years. The, the scriptures teach against that. Brother Henson taught us about that. Earth hasn't been there not even a billion years. That's, that's a lie. It is a lie. It is a lie to propagate why it took so long for a scale to turn into this and turn into that. And that's some of Darwin, who is a cursed being, lies made up. Now, you can't have God in Darwin. Amen. You gotta let somebody go. Can't serve two masters. As we get ready to wrap up, he says clearly that why? For in him we live and move and have our very being. As certain also of your own poets have said. For we also as offering. So those guys that write poems, they even write. They, they wrote the poem. Man, you know, God don't need nothing from us. The credit don't need anything from us. In him we have our being. Now, they, they've been reading the poems and don't understand the message. Even the poet knew. Now, you know, if he is God, the God who he says he is, then he would not need us. He is self-existing in and of himself. And they don't know how to worship him, right? But they know that. He doesn't need us. As I say, you've been looking at these poems all your life. You can't understand what the message said. Verse 29, for as much then as we are the offspring of God, or not to think of the Godhead, is like unto gold or silver or stone or graven by art or man's device. That's the power. That's the power we have to understand. Amen. Every Catholic church had a image carved some alleged image of what Jesus looked like and it is understood clearly it is a lie because no man is allowed to present an image of the true picture of how the man Jesus looked because it wasn't allowed. It wasn't it. See, when Paul says it is unlawful of him to talk about paradise, it's like a lock, a rule, a law that locks you up. See, it doesn't enter any man's mind other than that liar, that, that Catholic induced liar, Michelangelo, to lie and say he, he had an image showing him. Well, he's a liar because there's a lock. Because God does not want us to know him after the flesh anymore. And Paul said that. And Paul also said in the New Testament. We don't know any man after the flesh. We don't know you after your flesh anymore. We know you not as a holy clean person. We don't know you after the flesh anymore. No man. And started with the image of Christ. Oh, you know picture. He's a liar. 
He lied, and that's why damnation will be his reward and every other false teaching believer. And so as we end this particular session here to encourage others to understand God, verse 30 says, And the times is ignorant, God winked at. But now, commanded all men everywhere to repent. Somebody has to stop and say, well, this wink that mean he let them go? No, what do you think Sheol is? He put them in there. The problem is God said, okay, I told you I have a time when I bring all y'all to me. And it's the time. I'm not going to keep tossing y'all in hell. I'm going to bring you all to me through Christ. And this is the time. And I'm not going to accept any more of the hopes of one day is coming. It's here. It's now. In the day that you hear his voice, harden not your heart according to the book of Hebrews, according to the song. In the day you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. So the Lord says, okay, this is the time. Because the people on earth now, that's nothing to look forward to. He's saying, this is the time. Time to obey. Time to get baptized. Time to come to Christ. There's no more waiting. So when you hear someone say, when the law returns, see, he's going to fix this thing. The law's not fixing nothing, but putting people in hell or taking them to heaven. See, that's, that's why that is said, now cause all men. See, it's not going to be no thousand year reign. Now call it all men. We need to remember this text. Now is the time. Our salvation is now. Either you will make it, Oh, you and I, there's nothing coming after. He says in verse 31, because he had a point in the day, that's why. Into which, watch this, he would judge the world, not save the world, judge the world, because he's already sent the same. This is nothing else to judge. So that's saying a thousand year reign, give people no chance. That's a lie. This is the thing you watch out for always. Groups that teach there's no hell. Jehovah's Witness teach that. Other groups. Groups that teach there's going to be a second chance. A lot of saints that are wolves in sheep clothing they have gone to a belief system like that they have akin themselves kindred spirits to the denomination world that that's going to be another chance hmm. they have bought into the system of lies that's right. because they're not the elect see the elect are protected those that love the law that group isn't he says in righteousness he's going to judge them by that man whom he hath ordained it's already done E.D. ordained past. Well, uh, he had given assurance to all men and that he had raised them from the dead. Past tense. Raised. Nothing else to do. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, look at the action. Some mocked. <laughs> what a bunch of heathens. A man come tell you, you can live again. You can live again. Why are you trying to watch what you eat? Because you want to live. Why are you trying to watch if a sword don't cut your throat? Because you want to live. Don't you want to live again after death? See, but I don't believe it. I'd rather believe in my false images. So he says, others said, we will hear thee again this matter. So Paul departed from among them. How bid certain men clave unto him and believe. Among the which was Dionysius. The Aeropagite. That's just supreme. That's a big time judge. That's what got him there. Paul hooked up a big time supreme court fellow. A judicial giant. Isn't that wonderful? And a woman named Damaris and others with them. Three times, brother, I was sending a message. I don't even know that it didn't register in my mind the parts of the day being Mother's Day, but three times in one chapter. Chief women, honorable women, and a specific named woman. Sisters, understand, and women of the earth, God has never forgotten about you. He never forgot how much he loves you. Although men may pay you less, treat you bad, and act a fool with you, the God of heaven will one day give you much to rule over if you be a faithful servant and you do good while you're on the earth. The Lord will reward you. Amen. Because the Lord has not forgotten that he made women and men. Amen. And if we understand that, we can comprehend. We had a wonderful question posed today by a wonderful brother, Brother Green in Chicago, trying to express the thought Pray for him that the brother will understand women have to be included in a final process before you accept leaders or new evangelists or any process you're going to do. They have to be included to see is it right by God. Acts chapter 1 says to pick another apostle. They have to discuss it before the women. So before it's final. Brother, are good at bringing up stuff. We have decided as leaders. How did you decide that? 
Did the sisters hear anything about it? Well, you know the men, they on the surf of thunder. Nobody just surfing no thunder. You need to run by. Because all up to this point, only men have decided. And you haven't passed by the sisters yet to see if did you miss anything? It's amazing they wouldn't have picked the next apostle. And neither would the Lord select the next apostle until they passed it by the sisters. Isn't that amazing? I think that's enough right there. I think that's enough right there to understand. It's got you gotta say something for the sister before it becomes final. Nevertheless, this is what people do. If we can understand that, we understand that everybody everywhere must change, including leaders in the church, have to understand you can't tell a foot, or you can't tell the elbow, or you can't tell the hand, or you can't tell the knee, I don't need you. The scriptures are clear in 1 Corinthians 12. You have no authority to say that. So if we can understand that repentance change. Acknowledge Jesus died his bed on the third day he rose again. If you can accept that and embrace it within your heart, the Lord God will rescue. What are the steps needed? You say, well, I've been baptized. Acts 19, 1 through 5, and Acts chapter 2 is clear. Your baptism prior to hearing the truth means nothing to the Lord. You are not saved, and we hope and pray that you'll accept that. And the scriptures teach very, very clearly that if a person can accept that, he still believes Jesus died his bed on the third day he rose again, the scriptures teach. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be down. Mark 16 and 16. And when Peter preaches, they ask him, men and brethren, what shall we do? Acts 2, 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise unto you and your children, all that are far, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And many other words, he testifies and encourages them. Save yourself from this unto all that is perverted generation. Then they that glad receive his word were baptized the same day. Three thousand souls added unto them. And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Acts 2 42. The fellowship, the breaking of bread, and in prayer. And the Lord added. Aren't you glad it's the Lord? Acts 2 42. The Lord added. Not man, not the leadership, not the evangelist. Thank God. The Lord added to the church. So it should be saved. Why? Because whatever the Lord puts in, you can't take out. And whatever he takes out, you can't put back in. He says it is his decree. We believe that in Acts chapter 8. The eunuch is so excited he wants to get baptized. But Philip, as the great gospel teacher that he was, said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. He says, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then he baptized him. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Validates. Why does Philip do that? Because you know the Holy Spirit is not going to do it if you don't have the right heart. Paul says, For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Gentile. Bond of friend have all been made to drink into one spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Peter validates it saved. The like big wave and baptism now saves us. Not to putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience to our God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone in heaven. It says angels, authorities, power, principalities, whatever you can think of, principalities, anything is subject to Christ. You know, George, the debater that lost the debate to Henry and Harvey, yeah kept saying the word baptism is important but is it essential I've mentioned it so many times you may have lost count it must be essential every time the Lord talks about something to do with salvation and lifting you up and giving you life and the spirit and removing filthy vile sins baptism is always right around the corner in the text that's amazing how blind a person can be nevertheless if some don't believe, it will not change the faith of God. Finally, Revelation 2.10, the Lord Jesus himself said this. This is the loving, kind Savior that died for us. He said, the devil should cast on you in prison. He says, be faithful on the debt and receive everlasting life. He touched you 10 days. He's going to try. He's going to try his best to expose something. Be faithful. See, the faith of the righteous will avail much. The faith will cause you to blossom out and say, hey, I believe all the way, Lord. And then you get the reward. If you believe that, you can get baptized. Now, if you're here, or you listen to the information, and you've stepped outside of the boundaries of the Lord, it's time to repent. All men everywhere must repent. Luke 17 says, repent is the hope. Though you will sin multiple times in a day, just turn and repent. It's all about change. And one day, we get that reward. If you listen online, just call the number and you will be directed to where to be baptized. Those that are of faith. Whatever category you're in, come now together. We stand and sing heaven's invitation. And tenderly, Jesus is calling.
calling for you and for me.